I'm starting to see a world where people don't own their stuff anymore, but their stuff owns them. Dear Family is a podcast hosted by Rachel Steinman, a writer, an educator, and a mental health advocate. And Rachel gets us up close and personal, so we feel a strong connection, familiarity, and comfort with her guests. So settle in and join us as we search for true healing and journey with Rachel and her most interesting guests. Hi, dear family and friends. Get ready for another inspirational and eye-opening story. Thank you so much for listening. And if you aren't already doing so, please subscribe and share, dear family. It means the world to me and makes all the difference. And if you want to continue and contribute to the conversations, please join my private Facebook group, Dear Family Members. You get to see secret photos and videos only Dear Family Members are privy to, and you'll even have the opportunity to ask me and my guests questions directly. The link is in the show notes. I can't wait to see you there. One-click ordering, free delivery, storage units, sentimental stashing, and hand-me-down furniture. Our families are dealing with a clutter crisis. Enter Tracy McCubbin to the rescue as she jokes, quote, you can't scare me with your junk. I throw away dead people's sex toys. Tracy grew up with family members who hoarded, and she knows firsthand the effects of living amongst too many possessions goes far beyond the home's walls. So much of what we hold on to is charged by family dynamics and emotions. While working for a major television director in Los Angeles, Tracy discovered she had the ability to see through any mess by clearly envisioning a clutter-free space. Coupled with keen time management and organizational skills and her kind and empathetic approach, Tracy soon found more and more people were asking for her help. And before she knew it, Declutterfly was born. Tracy calls herself obsessive compulsive delightful, helping Hollywood's A-list celebs and creating a booming business. Tracy's a regularly featured expert in the media, including the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Goop, Home and Family, Real Simple, and more. She's taken all she's learned in assisting her clients for the past 12 years, and she's turned it into a fantastic book called Making Space Clutter Free. Tracy's here today to help us unclutter our lives and our minds and find some peace. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Rachel. Hi, welcome. I wanted to share a personal story that stayed with me to this day. I will never forget when I was about 12 years old, a friend invited me and my girlfriend back to his house for the first time. And as I walked through his home, it was piled high with trash and junk the likes of nothing I'd ever seen before. And my eyes bugged out as I took in my very chaotic and filthy surroundings. And, you know, the look of embarrassment on my friend's face, it just cut me straight to my heart because I knew it took a lot for him to ask me over and I could tell he regretted it. And the shame was just so visceral because we both knew it wasn't a way for anyone to live and that he deserved so much better. And, you know, I know what you're doing is very helpful to people because there's no more emotionally charged situation than trying to identify what items in our lives we should carry with us. And I feel like the relationship that people have to their things and their material in general is related to family and how you grew up. So since this is a podcast about family secrets and about finding mental wellness, What are your thoughts on the topic? So that story that you shared is so illuminating. You know, that young man, I feel so much for him. And, you know, not to assume your age, Rachel, but at that time when you were 12, they hadn't really even figured out hoarding was its own disorder. Really for a long time, they thought it was a symptom of obsessive compulsive disorder. And it's just recently in the last couple of years that they have the therapeutic and psychiatric community figured out that's a disorder unto its own that comes with its own issues. So I think we're having a real revelation about what that means and that, you know, there's sort of a difference between someone who's a hoarder and has hoarding disorder and someone who's cluttered and messy and are they just a pack rat? And it's really causing us to look inward. 
And so much of that stuff about how we keep our home and how we live our lives is passed on from our families. And I think there's a lot of us that are the generationless Gen Xers who had so many people in our grandparents and above who were children of the depression, right? So we learned so many of our habits and our beliefs about our stuff from them. And it's really hard to shake. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, we'll talk more about, you know, like the millennials view of stuff in a minute. But I think that's really true. You know, like if your grandparent was a child of the Great Depression, they're going to hold on to everything or they did hold on to everything. And then maybe your parents learned that and then it got passed down to you. And, you know, there's definitely a relationship when it comes to our stuff and family. But it's also really interesting to think about that. Yeah. When I was 12 years old, I didn't know what hoarding was. I just thought, oh, my God, my friend's mom is so dirty. You know, I was right. making judgment. Yeah, she's a terrible housekeeper. Exactly. And I think that in this conversation, so many people who have grown up with parents with some kind of mental illness, there's so much shame around it. And then hoarding it's so visible, right? That's that right. It's just out there for people to see. And I think that we're in this age now where we are bombarded with images of what a perfect home is supposed to look like. You go on Pinterest, you go on Instagram and everything looks perfect. You know, before it was, you read a magazine, you looked at a newspaper, or you watch TV. Now it's Instagram, Pinterest, you know, 16 platforms to tell you that your home isn't good enough. And so if you grew up with a messy home, now you're going, there's something really wrong with me. And, you know, what I tried to accomplish with my book is that there is a difference between clutter and people who have a hoarding disorder. And there is great resources out there for people who are dealing with that. But for those of us that are just dealing with too much stuff and wondering why we can't let go, it's because we're emotionally attached. We give so much meaning to our stuff. Yeah, there's definitely like shades of gray, right? Just, I mm -hmm. mean, we all are attached to our stuff. It doesn't mean that we have hoarding disorders. So I know that you mentioned that you grew up in a family with somebody that hoarded. How old were you when you noticed that? And how did it make you feel? Well, it was my great uncle. So I saw it my whole life, you know, because he was my grandmother's generation. And, you know, we just wrote it off as eccentric, right? You just knew that when you went to visit him, my grandmother would stop at the A&W down the road and we would use the restroom because you knew you wouldn't go into the house. We would sit in the backyard and have tea and there were newspapers stacked all up on the front porch. But those were the days, that was the 70s. You know, you just called him the crazy old man down the road or the weird eccentric guy. It was like he had taken frugality to the next level, right? They grew up in the depression. Well, he just was saving those newspapers because he might need them or he was saving those rubber bands. So there was sort of a practical reason for it that made people just didn't see the disorder part of it. And I think that's what's really changed when people have realized, oh, this is an actual disorder similar to agoraphobia. You know, it's really tied to some kind of emotional trauma. And so I think that there's starting to be a lot of help for it, which is fantastic. Yeah, you know, which is why I love talking about mental wellness, because I think the more we talk about it, the more we talk about getting rid of our dirty laundry quote, you know, it's helpful for everyone, right? And opening those closets and exposing those, you know, what's in there. This is interesting. I think if we go back and we look at Puritan and religious values, it was very important to keep a clean home, right? Well, yeah. I mean, cleanliness was next to godliness. Exactly, exactly. But also you think too, you know, definitely in the Middle Ages, like so much cleanliness was disease prevention. Right, health, like actual physical health. Yeah, so, you know, there's a reason to keep a clean house. You know, I think people have to understand that we all don't live the same way, right? I live by myself most of the time. My boyfriend and I kind of go back and forth between two apartments, but there's, just two of us and there's not very much stuff. I'm not a family of five, so I don't have near the same amount of possessions. But what I'm seeing, you know, I've been a professional declutterer for 12 years now. And why I wrote my book, Making Space Clutter-Free, is that I'm starting to see a world where people don't own their stuff anymore, but their stuff owns them. 
Yeah, that's powerful. You know, that we don't have a handle that we're renting storage units off site because we can't even put all our stuff on our own houses. You know, we're not eating a family dinner at the dining room table because it's covered with stuff. By the way, the listeners should know that my dining room table is covered with stuff right now. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Thank you for sharing that because no one is perfect. Right. Exactly. So just so everybody knows, I... You're human. Exactly. And that's the difference that mine has stuff on it right now because it's in process. But I know within five minutes, I could put everything away right? and I could serve a meal at my table. So it's when it gets to that point where you can't tidy a room up in 20 minutes. So Tracy, my husband, Todd, I will call him slightly OCD when it comes to certain things like organizing our spice drawer and pantry and garage. And I totally end up benefiting from it because clearly he doesn't have a hoarding issue or a major OCD issue. It's more like a preference. But for me, I'm okay with kind of that out of sight, out of mind mentality. Our house is pretty clean overall because we moved after our daughters were young and got rid of all that big plastic furniture that kids tend to have when they're little. But partly because Todd's a foot taller than me, I often just will throw things high up on a shelf because it's out of sight, out of mind, like I said. But he sees the clutter and it drives him crazy. And it's usually, you know, causes little tips between us, nothing major. But my guess is that you must be somewhat of a relationship expert because you're having to deal with not just husbands and wives, but kids and their parents, right? When they're retiring or people are moving. And I just am curious how you deal with different cleanliness habits within a family. It's such a great question. And I joke with my clients all the time. I always say marriage counseling is included. You know, it's so interesting. I have had the great fortune to fall madly in love and find my great love. And he is very messy. He doesn't have a lot of stuff, which is good, but the stuff that he does have is very messy. And so I've had to, in real life, learn how to navigate, all right, what's important, what's not important. If this stuff is important to me and not important to him, can I just do it? You know, where do you expect the other person to come to your standards or you to theirs, that it's really a negotiation. And so, so many times, I mean, I do get called in a lot when someone has a really bad clutter problem and the other person has a very, very minimal, you know, and that can be really challenging, but it comes about, it was Michael Franti, the musician I saw on his uh Instagram he was talking about the first year of his marriage to his wife. And he said that the phrase that they use when things are getting a little tough is, do you want to be right or do you want to be close? Oh, I love that. Yeah. And so I say that a lot to my clients. Like, do you want to be right? Like, is your way right? Not necessarily. But if the clutter, if the other person's clutter is getting in the way of the unit, the relationship, the family, then it becomes an issue, right? Like, somebody's house the other day and, you know, the husband couldn't sleep in the bed because they had so much clutter on their side of the room and the wife's side was immaculate and they weren't sleeping together anymore. And their intimacy was, you know, really taking a toll. So when your clutter, even though you think you're fine with it, starts to affect your relationship with the other people in the household, then that's when it becomes an issue. Then that's when you have to look at, is this stuff more important? Like I said to him, are these magazines that you're never going to read more important than laying in bed with your wife at night? Yeah, no, that's a really good question to pose to somebody that is questioning about their stuff, if whether or not to keep it. You estimate that 90% of the homes that you enter are in some level of crisis and that the clutter creates no small amount of shame and it causes an enormous emotional toll. So what do you think someone's mess says about them and what they need in their life? You know, it's funny. I've often said I can read clutter like tea leaves. You know, if I see overstuffed closet that's full of clothes that people can't fit into anymore, then, you know, that's usually body shame issues. Yeah. If a kitchen's really cluttered and they can't cook healthy meals and they don't have clear countertops, then oftentimes that's about relationships with food. You know, the other example I gave of not being able to sleep in the same bed or the eat at the dining room table, you know, that 
I think often we use our stuff to literally build barriers Mm. to keep us from being close and intimate. You know, if we're managing all this stuff and we're doing this, and I really see this, I'm sure I'm going to get letters about this, but I see this a lot with working parents who feel very guilty about not spending what they think is the right amount of time with their kids. So they overbuy them a lot of toys so that their kids are busy all the time with the toys. And it's you know, like compensating for their guilt, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, we were somewhere, a client that had that scenario where the parents were working all the time and the child had so many toys and we were packing donations up and all he wanted to do was play in the box. He didn't yeah. need all the toys, you yeah. know, and really he just wanted to play around us and the people. Yeah. I mean, that makes me think about my mom whose father was a huge real estate mogul and was never around and just tried buying her love when all she wanted was just his time. So yeah, that's a very interesting, really deep thought for sure. Yeah. And so I think that what, you know, people need to understand, it's funny, stuff started as tools, right? Right. You know, a bed you sleep in and a fork and knife you cut with. And then with the advent of the middle class, It was like, oh, the more stuff we have, it shows that we're not poor, that we're a different socioeconomic level. So then stuff became to represent, you know, I have to have more stuff to show where I am in the world. And then it took on this whole new meaning and it stopped being tools. And then I feel like we jumped into this level where we're using our stuff, not dissimilar to food or video games or alcohol, you know, to avoid our feelings. We use our stuff to stuff our feelings. Right. Like quote, shopping therapy or whatever. Right. Right. I say in the book, but if I showed up at a party, you know, ran into you and I said, oh, hey, Rachel. And you're like, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm great. I did five shots of tequila on the drive over here. You would be like, oh, Tracy, we need to have a talk, <laughs> right. right? But if I said to you, oh, hey, Rage, you know, I was just at Nordstrom's and I got five pairs of shoes on sale right before I came here. You're like, oh, fantastic. Let it's me see true. them. It's true. You know, but you don't know if for me, those five pairs of shoes were no different than five shots of tequila, but somehow right. the shopping is okay. We reward it and we make t-shirts about it. And you know, like you said, retail therapy. And it's just so easy now with Amazon Prime to just like one click and you can just get what you need without really like thinking about Oh, the Rachel, cost. I can get groceries delivered and not have to put my pants on. Amazing, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it hits to cart and here it comes. And so we're losing this mindfulness about, you know, look, if you had to get dressed, get in your car, drive somewhere to buy something, you're going to think about like, do I really need it? But if you're ordering Instacart online and you're just, you know, playing the slot machine of online ordering, you're going to order way more than you ever want. How do you counsel your clients? Do you say like, maybe like take a day to think about if you need it or like, what do you? Yeah, there's a couple great things. One of the first things that I tell my clients is to stop using the word need yeah. So don't say, oh, I need a new pair of jeans. I'm like, are you a rancher? You have right. tent. You don't right. need. Change it to want. Yeah. So that's a fantastic, like just change the word to want. And look, you may still want it. Somebody else told me this. I did a podcast and I thought this was so interesting. For every hundred dollars of value of an item, you wait a day to buy it. So if it's $100 and you think you want to buy it today, you wait one day. If it's $200, you wait two days, et cetera, et cetera, to see if you still really want it. I thought that was such a great way to kind of... That's a great tool. Yes. Isn't that great? I love that. I love that. Believe me, I will be using that. (laughs) I know. I was shopping with a friend of mine and her teenage daughter and the friend of the teenage daughter. And there was this purse on sale and I was like, oh, I want it. I need it. It's so cute. Oh, you know, it's such a good sale price. And I think it was $250 on sale. But of course I went down the road, but it's marked down from 500. I'm saving $250. And she took that, this 13 year old, she took the purse out of my hand and she said, imagine there's $250 in my other hand. Which one would you take? And I was like, oh, I'd take the cash. And she's like- That's a very wise 13 year old. (laughs) Exactly. And she's like, then don't buy the purse. You know, so we get so impulsive about our buying 
that right. there are some things that we can do to kind of slow yeah. that impulsivity. There's a great book. Caitlin Flanders wrote this really great book called The Year of Less. And Ooh. she doesn't spend money for a year. I mean, she buys some. She has to buy food, buy, right? Yeah. Yes, she has a list of essentials, but uh-huh. she doesn't buy any non-essentials for a year. And the journey that she goes through, it's amazing. And it's very personal. And it's things that I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but it's such an amazing read about, you know, how confronting not being able to shop was. So, you know, it's funny because the other day I was in one of those moods, like I need some new jeans. Literally, I said that. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to clean out my closet first and see what I have. And after going through and cleaning out my closet and organizing it, I tried on some pants I forgot I even had, and I don't need new jeans. Yeah, isn't it amazing? So it is really amazing how just taking an inventory of what you already have rather than just kind of getting that endorphin rush of like buying something new can save you money and time and all of that. And I'm sure that's what you caution. Yeah. And that's why I always tell people, don't go to the grocery store without a list. Right. 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 Take a minute before you go through. I mean, I joke that I must have a mustard obsession because I always seem to come home with mustard. (laughs) And I was like, I think I'm out of mustard, you know, because I didn't go with a list. So, you know, put some things into practice that are going to help you. Yes. I love that. And I saw this somewhere, which I bet you're going to like too. And it was a quote and it said, clutter is the physical manifestation of unmade decisions fueled by procrastination. And I know that you've said organization involves awareness of your habits. Can you explain what that means? That's such a great quote. I always say clutter is just delayed decision-making. Ooh, You know, that it's this idea of you don't know where to put something, so you just put it down. I don't know what to do with this. And that comes from a couple of things. That comes from you haven't put systems in place in your house where, you know, everything has a home, you know, a place for everything and everything in its place, or that the places that your stuff should live are so stuffed with stuff you don't use anymore, right? So when I see clutter out, it's not like we're going to open the closets and they're going to be empty. It's right. because the closets are full and you can't put anything away. So, you know, if there's a ton of like sports equipment and things all over the dining room, then I'm going to ask you to show me your garage because the chances are you can't put things in the garage or let alone park your car. Only 25% of Americans can park their cars in their garage. Wow. Amazing. Isn't that, I mean, that's just, it's just like used as another storage system. So, you know, I also see being minimalist as being an environmentalist and I am very much an environmentalist and I'm teaching my daughters to be the same. It's something very important to my husband too. But, you know, when you're a new mom, it's difficult, right? Because you think your baby needs two kinds of strollers and all these millions of plastic toys. I have to hope that our younger generation is hopefully more cognizant of this. You know, like, for example, how many mugs do you need for coffee, right? And this is all part of it. But how do we recognize that we're consuming more than we need? First thing I say to people is, you know, think about when you throw something away, where's away? Right. Where does it go? And, you know, when I've been dealing with, lately is these water bottles. Like everyone's gotten refillable water bottles, which is great, but guess what? You only need one. (laughs) Yeah. You only, you know, sometimes if the kids play sports or something, or you work, you know, sometimes I'll let everybody have two in the family, but I'm looking at mine right now. I'm like, I have five, like it's just too much. And I know minimalism is tricky. I'm not a minimalist. I think it's a very noble and amazing way to live. And it takes real discipline. But I think that there are so many ways that we can split the difference and things that we can be mindful about. One of the things that I'm seeing, especially on social media, all over Instagram that I love is these young women have embraced thrift store shopping again. When I was in college back in, you know, the stone age, that's what we did. We went and stopped at thrift stores and we bought vintage dresses and we thought it was so punk rock. But I'm seeing it happen again. And 
you know, these young women who are taking, you know, outfits from Vogue and then going and recreating them from things they buy in the thrift stores. And so I do think there's a mindfulness. I and I think you're right. Yeah. That makes me happy. My teenager daughter's doing the same thing. It's just great, right? Yeah, like it's yeah, just it makes me happy. Know, I remember my first apartment, everything came either somebody gave it away or I got it at the thrift store. And I think that we need to go back to that, that we don't have to have everything all new, that my whole apartment doesn't have to be Ikea or West Elm and everything has to be brand new, that we can recycle and reuse. You know, I don't know what department store is doing this, but I think I heard it was Macy's and I will double check in the show notes, but they're considering having a secondhand section because they see that the younger generation really does want more vintage and some older things. And all this fast fashion is just, you know, cheap, you know, it makes sense Mm -hmm. maybe for some things. So, you know, that is a positive movement. That's so interesting. I'd love to know who that is. Yeah, I I know there are a lot of clothing lines like H&M. You can take old clothes back to them. And if they're not donatable, they recycle the fabric and turn it into housing insulation, I believe. That's awesome. Yeah, Patagonia does it. Eileen Fisher does it. There's quite a few companies. J. Crew does it. J. Crew takes old denim. So there are ways to do it. You know, it takes a little bit of effort, but that's the only way we're going to make lasting changes is everybody's got to put a little effort in. And to go one step further, which kind of kicked this all off is it's about being mindful about what you buy. How right. much do you bring into your house? Right? Right. Right. Not being the wasteful. real trick. Not being wasteful. And so, you know, I know Marie Kondo, she was all the rage earlier this year, but a new house, beautiful poll found that her KonMari method does not work for 80% of people. So why do you think that is? You know, she has been fantastic for my business and she has started an amazing conversation. She really was a zeitgeist into making people realize. But I think for so many people, her method is very oversimplified. That there's one question and it's a yes or no. And for the clients that I've dealt with, and I've been doing this for 12 years, you know, for my clients... It's so much more complicated. There's so many emotional attachments. And the way I describe it is that we write these emotional stories about our stuff and these emotional stories become blocks. And I call them the clutter blocks. There are literally seven of them. I think we all have at least one and some of us have more than that. So that's what made me write my book because I wanted to take these blocks that I was seeing my clients come up against and put it in a book so that everyone could read it. Okay, well, great. So I was just about to ask you about your book, Making Space Clutter-Free. And can you just tell us maybe about some of the most common clutter blocks that you see in your clients? Oh, yeah. There's seven of them. And the wildfires in California really made me think about clutter block number five, which is I'm not worth my good stuff. So this is my people who have their grandmother's china, but won't ever use it, you know, have expensive scented candles that they don't want to burn because they're saving them for someday, clothes with tags on them in the closet because they're too nice to wear, right? This is the idea that there is a someday that is a good and special day that deserves all this stuff. But, you know, in case of the wildfires, the people who lost everything those special days never came or they came and they just didn't celebrate them. So I want everyone to know that every day is special and, you know, take your Chinese takeout and eat it on your grandma's china. Enjoy it. There is no special occasion. I just see this one so much. You know, we're so hard on ourselves. That's one of the things I see with my clients, that they are just so hard on themselves. They feel so much shame that their pantry doesn't look like it belongs on Instagram and that their closet doesn't look like a Kardashian's. And, you know, they just beat themselves up. And I feel like so many of us are really doing the best we can. And I mean that not like, oh, you're doing the best you can, but like you're really doing a great job. So go easy on yourself, you know, make the changes you need to make to make your life better and run smoother, but cut yourself some slack, you know? But you know, this is why I love having you on this podcast about wellness and family, because truly it is 
by looking at your environment and your surrounding and deciding what's important and what you want to literally surround yourself with, it's about self-awareness and it's about what's going to bring you happiness and what's going to help you like live your best life. And that's what you're doing. Right. And that's great. And it really is self-awareness. And sometimes in the journey into self-awareness, there's the moment of like, oh, that behavior doesn't fit me anymore. You know, I love what Brene Brown says that guilt is I did a bad thing and shame is I am a bad person. And so I talk about this so much with my clients, like, look, yes, you got here, you know, your house is cluttered, your closet doesn't support you getting dressed and, you know, running out the door feeling great in the morning, but that doesn't make you a bad person. It's just a bad habit. Let's change it. And I think that people's relationship to stuff and their clutter, especially with what I lay out in the book, is it's changeable. You can change it. You can change your perception, which is fantastic. Well, speaking of your book, so in my private Facebook group, I have a group called Dear Family Members. I asked for some listener questions and I got so many great ones because everyone has really good questions. But the question I'm choosing comes from a woman named Julie Kinrich. And as a bonus, she gets a copy of your book, Making Space Uh Clutter Free. Yay, Julie. But here's her question. Do you ever recommend your clients seek professional mental health help if you notice their compulsion? And does the realization a person is hoarding come out during the process of grappling with other issues? Wow, Julie, that's a great question. Or questions. That's (laughs) fantastic. Well, I always recommend the help of a mental health professional because I think we should all be in therapy. (laughs) I think there's no one that wouldn't benefit from it. So I'm like, absolutely. And I do for hoarding in particular, it's very successful with something called cognitive behavior therapy. So that's great. That's a very specific kind of therapy and it works very well with people. So I know that there are some quizzes online that you can take to see if you actually have hoarding disorder. And I think that a mental health professional is a great place to go with this. And there are definitely been people who have read my book and been like, oh yeah, this makes sense. Or you know what? This goes a little bit deeper. And I have seen this often. I've had people call me who have been doing some pretty intense therapeutic work on other issues and have realized that their stuff plays into it a lot. So have wanted to get a control on their stuff. You know, for a great example is I get calls after people really confront an eating disorder or body image disorder and realize that, you know, they want to make their closet something that celebrates them, not a disaster that makes them feel even worse about themselves. So, and I know that you often go into homes after really traumatic events, like the death of a spouse or a parent, and you really, in a way, are acting as, in a way, family therapist, right? You're helping people decide what they should hold on to. And I just give you a lot of credit. That cannot be easy. Yeah. You know, it's actually sounds weird to say this, but it's actually my favorite kind of decluttering because it can be so healing for people. And, you know, to go in my team and I to go in and really try and respect the legacy of the family or what people need to go through right? That what they need to realize or not realize. And, you know, it's interesting. My boyfriend was just cleaning out his mother's house after she passed. And, you know, there was a lot of processing going on. And also in the passing of a parent, the siblings are all taking on new roles and who do they become? And, you know, how does one person deal with it? You know, the question I get all the time is, well, how soon after someone passes away, should you clear out their stuff? And it's like, Well, that just depends on so many things like financially, you know, can you afford to keep the house or, you know, I've had a lot of times where people, someone's passed away suddenly and their partner and they're like, you know what, I want to switch bedrooms. We literally move them, all their stuff into a different bedroom. They're like, I need to know that things are different now. So there's no prescriptive for it, but you know, you will know at a certain point if, you know, it's getting in the way, if you're not moving forward. And that's a question when people ask me that, you know, who've lost someone, like, 
when is it time? And I'm like, when you feel like you're not moving forward, when you feel like that you're not progressing and you can progress and move forward and still not, you know, lose the love that you felt for someone. And I think that's what they're worried about. Well, you've seen so many different homes and so many different scenarios, but I have a feeling you probably can catalog what the hardest things are for people to give up. What does that tend to be? You know what? It just depends on the person. I mean, I have people who lose their, like just lose it over old magazines Mm. to other people who, you know, baby teeth. I mean, (laughs) you know, that just the amount of pregnancy tests and ovulation tests, Mm. you know, that people keep umbilical cords and, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, you know, all But those are very sentimental. Of course. And I'm not, I'm yeah, absolutely. So things that are more sentimental than like, you know, which I understand, you know, like when my daughter just has really wanted to move from like a little girl room to a a teen room and got rid of all her books and all of her stuff. I was so sad, but I totally understood. One of my favorite stories, I was helping a client of mine. She's the child of hoarders. So it's very difficult for her. And she was trying to instill good habits into her son. So I would come and help him. And I think he was going into first grade. He might have been going into second grade. And he was like, you know, I want to get rid of all my baby books. Like, you know, I'm older now and I want to get rid of my baby books. And he's getting rid of them. And I just see her face like, oh, God, not that one. Oh, really? That one? Yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then my favorite moment was we got to pat the bunny and he goes, put it in the box, but just don't let me see it. That one's really hard. And Aww. I was like, you know what? If you want to keep pat the bunny, keep pat the bunny. And he's like, I want to keep it, you know? And, and his mom was like, I'm so glad. That one would have broke my heart, you know, but it's the thing about, you know, there's one thing of a small box of the girl's favorite books that you can, you know, hopefully someday share with your grandchildren or, you know, that their book becomes a museum to who they were, right? right? That's the difference. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So once someone purges their clutter, what's the secret to halting what you call the clutter creep? That comes with self-awareness. That comes with what we were talking about earlier about bringing the stuff in, right? Getting really aware of what you buy and how you're buying and where you're spending and do you want versus need, you know, really getting honest with yourself, right? How much do you actually need? You know, one of the things they say is like, if there was an emergency and you had to get out of your house fast, what would you grab, right? We just saw this with the wildfires. What would you really actually grab? So it's about being honest. It's about self-realization. And then it's also, you know, one of the little litmus tests that I love to tell people is, can you neaten up, can you tidy up a room in 20 minutes or less? You know, and by the way, parents with playrooms, I give you guys a half an hour because that stuff takes forever (laughs) to put away. Oh my God. I was yeah, just with my Legos. niece and nephew. Oh, <laughs> oh, the like creatures, all these just little, yeah. and each creature just gets smaller than the next. But, you know, can you tidy up a room in 20 minutes? If not, the clutter's getting the upper hand. That's a great question to ask yourself. And what about like, for example, when I clean my closet and realize that I had a ton of pants I could wear. Do you agree with the idea of, getting rid of a pair of pants if I bring a new one in? Yes. Yes. I tend to try and do two or three things, Oh, you know, because here's the thing, you have a finite amount of space in your closet, right? So if it's full and you bring something else in, you don't want to cram it in there, right? Right. So I do, I'm very good with one thing in and one thing out. I think that works really well. You know, I have a constant donation bag and it just circles through. And especially if you've done a deep, profound decluttering in your house, you get your house to a point where you're like, this feels great. Yeah. So to stay there, you got to stay on top of the decluttering. Because by the way, the stuff's not going to stop coming in. The holidays are coming up. People are going to give you stuff you don't need, right? That's just right around the corner. The commercial's already making me crazy. I know. I mean, and it reminds me of like my mom who used to come down when the girls were little and she felt the need to have to bring them things. And, you know, I tried to let her know that the girls are just happy. Go do experiences, go take them to a movie. They'd prefer that. You know, I think we also have to teach our kids that, right? That experiences are just as invaluable. I have a whole group of parents that I know that have like 
three or four sets of grandparents because of steps, parents and all that stuff. And they told their children from birth, oh no, parents don't buy children present. It's only grandparents. Because they're like, we get so many that we don't have, you know, it's just, right. oh, no, no, no. You know, and I think that it's about how much do we buy for other people, right? Yeah. And I mean, I have to say, like, what we do for our kids is we will buy like a Broadway ticket or, you know, an experience or save up to go on a trip. And those are the things that stay with my girls and with us. Or you do, you know, one Christmas with stuff and one Christmas you take a trip, right? And right. you do you know, I just think we're being bombarded to buy, right? That's the right. messaging is there all the time and you don't have to do it. You That's know? right. That's right. Well, so we are coming to the end of our interview and I asked this question to all of my guests. So Tracy, if you could write your younger 20 year old self a love letter, a dear Tracy letter, what would it say? Oh, that's so fantastic. It would say, dear Tracy, do not worry if that boy likes you or not. (laughs) Do not waste the time. If he likes you, it's something. If he doesn't, do not worry about it. And that $10,000 that you just inherited, put it in a savings account. Do not spend it. Such good advice. <laughs> when your young money seems to burn a hole in your pocket, doesn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> and I love that. So Tracy, is there anything that you do that brings you happiness? Any grounding activities? You know, I'm back on the yoga mat. Uh-huh. I had been not doing that for a while and I'm back on the yoga mat, which is great. My boyfriend has an apartment at the beach and we like to go and watch the sunset. Overlooking, Yeah, it's walkable from his apartment. And when we get to do that, we sort of go and spend an hour or two and it gives us a chance to talk. And it's those moments of creating a space for intimacy. It's really special. I love that. Well, you know, you're being in the moment and that I think brings us the most happiness. I know that you're involved in a great organization, One Kid, One World. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about it? And we'll have the link in our show notes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we rebuild schools in developing nations, focusing specifically on Central America and Kenya. And we get schools that a community has built that are struggling to stay open, the things that they need to keep kids in school. So we build classrooms, we put desks in, we pay teacher salaries. We get really basic, basic needs to keep education going. And it's really fantastic. And, you know, come visit us over Facebook too. And it's just been great. And, you know, the interesting thing, Rachel, I realized when I took the first trip to Kenya in 2006 with one kid, and I literally started my business that trip. My partner was the one that was like, I think you have a business doing this weird, throwing people's things away. I was like, what? What are you talking about? (laughs) I realized that in going to developing nations, that clutter really is a luxury. Yeah. You know, and I think we take that for granted. That's really interesting. So it's not a third world problem necessarily. It's more, you know, it comes with affluence sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that, you know, that it's kind of a, in some ways, a self-created problem, which is why I was so excited to write the book, Making Space Clutter-Free, because I wanted people to see to really illustrate the grip that their emotions and that the stories they or their families have told them about their stuff, they can actually break free of it. So where can the listeners find you? They can find me at Tracy McCubbin, which is M-C-C-U-B-B-I-N.com. I'm also really active on Facebook, which is This Is Tracy McCubbin, and Instagram, which is Tracy underscore McCubbin. Awesome. So we will have all of those links in the show notes. And I so appreciate what you're doing to not just educate us on decluttering, but also understanding those emotional blocks so that we can declutter with purpose. Yep. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, Rachel. Thank you so much, Tracy. You take care. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye. 
This is Rachel Steinman. For more information or to contact me with any questions, comments, or guest ideas, please check out rightnowrachel.com. That's right with a W. Thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and sharing, dear family. And if you found value in what you've just heard, I would love and so appreciate a great review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, I wish you love, happiness, and good mental health.